Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome friends, I'm Peter Herbeck. We're here again with another week of choices we face and I'm Really delighted to be able to introduce to you a good friend, a fantastic priest, Father Mark Goring, who's a member of the Companions of the Cross. And he is, besides, you know, loving the Lord with all his heart as a good priest, he's also a surfer, a skateboarder, a motocross guy, and a passionate preacher of the gospel. Welcome, Father Mark. Thank you. Good to be here. I forgot to mention, you're the pastor of St. Mary's Parish that's in right. Ottawa now, yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I thought it'd be good today for people to just get to know you a little bit. I know you've got a very popular YouTube, uh, is it program? How do you say it? Yeah. You, YouTube each Yeah, day. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> YouTube channel. So you've got your own YouTube yeah. channel. And it's, it's really quite good. And you've touched a lot of lives. And so there's quite a few people out there who know you. But let's start with your story. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up in a good Catholic family, and uh, we went to church every Sunday. I went to Catholic school. Um, but as a young teenager, I just stopped believing in God. And I guess what happened is it just seemed like thinking people um, just all knew that, that God doesn't exist. You know, like the, the, the academic world, the the... the uh, entertainment industry. Like it, just, it just seemed like this whole thing of believing in God and worshiping God was kind of for more superstitious, uneducated you know, type yeah. people. And, um, and especially for me, I, I guess as a young teenager, I was quite a thinking person already. And, you know, it's just like there's all these different religions. Like what makes me think mine is better than any other one? And also it, it seemed like the world of psychology was saying that everything we experience, like these, you know, religious experiences, that can all be explained by psychology or sociology or whatever. And so it just seemed like for me to believe in in God was 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 a bit of an intellectual suicide. And and I guess my experience too with 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 church was more kind of ritual. You know, you go to church on Sunday, you put in your hour, um, and and that's it. And and you know, there wasn't kind of an experience of the living God at week, you know, weekly mass and even at school when we were taught things, but the experience of God just wasn't a reality. And so, but what happened is, is, um, and I wasn't one of these kind of, you know, proud atheists. For me, it's like, it's, it's kind of, you know, bleak when you're thinking that the reality of who I am is consciousness because of, of, of brain waves. And one day the brain waves will stop and it's over. The, 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 this, you know, reality of who I am will, will just cease to be. And, and again, that outlook, like it's, it's, it's not, you know, very hopeful, um, but it, it didn't, it wasn't really a big issue until, you know, maybe 13, 14-ish when I started to have to make some moral decisions about how I was gonna live my life, you know, and you know, one, one of the big decisions, of course, was the whole question of getting into to, to premarital marital sex, you know, because at that age, my buddies were talking about what either what they were wanting to do with their girlfriends or doing with their girlfriends and things like that. And, you know, I was at an age where that was, you know, kind of really, you know, uh, interesting me too. And, and I just, I had to make a decision. Like, what road am I going to go down? You know, and am I going to go down the, you know, if it feels good, do it, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, or am I going to try to live a virtuous life according to, to the teachings of the church? And, and I mean, it seems like it'd be, well, it's a no brainer. Obviously you don't believe in God. So go down the road of, you know, if it feels good, do it. But already at that young age, 
I had enough life experience to know that if I go down the wide and easy road of if it feels good, do it and gratify your appetites and whatever, I knew that that road would not fulfill me. Like I knew it would leave me empty, you know? And it, and it was this, this frustration where like, I wanna be happy. Like I wanna be fulfilled, I want peace. And I know that if I go down the self-gratifying road of, of, you know, whatever, it's, it's gonna leave me empty, I know that. How did you know that at 13, 14? Your friends didn't well, just, seem to know it? Was it yeah, well just, I, I, guess, I guess just enough experiences where you, again, you, you, you gratify your appetites. You do the thing that you think is gonna make you yeah. so happy. You go to the party or you get the new dirt bike or the, you know, the new toy, and, and it just, it doesn't deliver. It, 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 if anything, it typically leaves you even more empty. You know, like I, yeah. Maybe it was maybe it was a grace of God, but the thing is, my other option was to to be a good little Catholic, and it's like I don't believe in God, and so it, it's almost like well, that's not an option. So I decided to talk to my dad about it, and I wasn't explicit. I mean, I didn't say, hey, I don't believe in God, and I want to have sex. You know, what should I do? You know, <laughs> but but the way I put it is, my family would oftentimes pray the rosary. So one night after the rosary, I just said to my dad, I said, Dad, like I don't mind praying the rosary like this. It doesn't bother me but I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. And I said, is, is that normal? Like, is being Catholic just like, you, you go to church, you say your prayers, you, you follow the rules, and hopefully if there's a heaven, you get to heaven, and that's it? Or, or I asked my dad, I said, or can you actually experience God? Like, kind of communicate, like know he's real. Can he, you know, affect, touch your life? And that's when my dad, like, his answer was, yeah, you can experience God. And if you want to learn about experiencing God, you should learn about the saints. And then he told me about people like St. Francis of Assisi and St. Teresa of Avila and, you know, St. Brother Andre up in Canada. He wasn't a canonized saint what yet then. What a good but, dad. What a good dad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And he had a couple little saint books and he, 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 you know, suggested one or two. And I started reading them and it changed my life forever, you know. I mean, it, it began... Uh, I, I opened my heart to the Lord. As I read these books, there was just this kind of, I mean, there was a, a lot going on at a lot of levels. One of them was the, just the fact that my dad explained to me, listen, before a saint is canonized, there's a very thorough process. So like someone like St. Padre Pio, like that stuff isn't made up. Like it's not like the, the church just bakes up these wild stories to convince people. If anything, it's the opposite. The church is extremely careful and skeptical and cautious. And they will want to verify things and they'll take years. And so he says, if the church canonizes someone, it's because the guy's legit. And so to learn that the church was so careful and so, you know, rational, you could say, reasonable with its, you know, uh, investigating saints and yet acknowledging that there is, you know, signs from God and the reality of God. Like it gave me a respect, you know, for the church and then, also the supernatural, like I guess God is real if, if you know, someone like St. Padre Pio wrestles with demons and has a stigmata and people are, are healed through his prayers. And, and what that led to, like, for example, St. Padre Pio, he said that the key to the heart of God is prayer. And so, you know, I, I'm reading this as a teenager. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to start praying to God, you know, not in kind of the mechanical way like I used to, but really I'm gonna, if, and if God's real, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to talk to him, like I wanna know. And so that was kind of my prayer, you know, I began. So what, did it, what did it look like and sound like as a teenager? Well, what believe, it, be, be, believe it or not, um, again, be, because my formation was so limited, uh, and I, I, at that point too, I'd begun to read scripture. So I, you know, when Jesus was asked how to pray, he, he said, when he prays, say, our Father who art in heaven. So I just, prayed every night before going to bed, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, but very, very slowly, you know, because I, I, one of the things I knew is, if God is real, He probably doesn't want us babbling prayers, like just kind of mechanically going through prayers. Like He, he actually probably wants us to mean what we say, you know? Yeah. And so I prayed the Our Father, and the other, the other, I prayed it very slowly, but the other thing from a saint was Saint Brother Andre, he said, when you, he says, God is so close to us, only a thin veil uh, hides him. Hmm. And he says, so when you pray the, our Father, 
God the Father's ear is right next to your lips. Hmm. And that image just caught my imagination. And so when I prayed the Our Father, I would imagine that God, like he, he, he's actually listening to me. You know? and, and that's when, you know, the transformation began to happen in my life. Um, and then one, one kind of experience that to, to kind of show what was happening in my life, I, I would pray every night, sometimes for a long time. Like, again, I was thirsty for God and, and hungering for Him. And as I would pray, it, you know, it led me to, to, to re repentance and things like that. But I remember one night I was laying in bed after my prayer time. And um, for me, typically as a teenager, nighttime was a time... Of, of, of being sad, of having trouble falling asleep, maybe being, I don't know, anxious and depressed, uh, temptations, fears. It, it was a time of darkness. And it was like that like, for a long time, you know, and it, maybe years. And, and it was just, I gotten used to that. Nighttime was a time of darkness. But that particular night, I was laying in bed after my prayer time, and I just noticed uh, there's none of that darkness. Like, and and uh, it was the opposite. It's like, I was happy. Like I'm laying in bed and I'm happy and none of that dark stuff is, is not only is it not even here, it do, didn't even seem to be around anywhere. Like it seemed to be gone, you know? And, and it was so real that I actually started thinking about my day wondering, did something happen yeah. today that's, that's making me so happy? And I couldn't think of anything. And, and, and it's like this, this happiness, it was like it was deep, deep inside of me and it was, it was this, this, I, what I now understand to be joy. You know, it was this yeah. deep, deep joy, but, but it felt kind of like a, a warmth, like a fire, but it was so, so peaceful. Like it wasn't emotional. It wasn't like I was all, you know, worked up or emo it, it, I, I felt so peaceful and joyful and it was like a fire. And, then, and again, I knew enough from my catechism, you know, growing up that I thought, I, I think this is the Holy Spirit yeah. inside of me, you know. And, and, and then the scripture, I learned the scripture where Jesus said, you know, when you pray, go to your room, close the door and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And I, I, I really believe that my father who sees in secret rewarded me by driving the darkness out of my heart and replacing it with his light and his presence and his Holy Spirit. You know, like I, it, I mean, it took a while for me to kind of clue in. It's like, wait a minute, like God is true to his promises. Yeah. And, and, and again, my seeking him, it really was sincere. I wasn't asking for a new bike. I wasn't, you know, like it, it really was, it's like, God, if you're real, I, I really do want to know you and, and I want to love you. And, you know, there's also that element of, like eternal life, like the idea of when I die, the brain waves stop, my consciousness ends, and that's it. Like it's that's a lot more bleak than the idea that you know when you die, if you've had faith in Jesus and loved Him, you spend all of eternity with your Father in heaven, where there's no tears, no pain. I mean, who doesn't want that? So there was also that element of like, who am I? What's the meaning of my life? What's what's my destiny? And that. It changed everything for me. How old were you? When that Again, was I was around 14, 15-ish. Oh, that's yeah. really, that's great. That's a yeah. blessing. I was thinking of the yeah. passage where Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Yeah. You could see that promise being fulfilled yeah, in yeah. your life. As you, yeah. began to, you began to follow him. Yeah. You made that decision. Yeah. You made concrete steps. You know, those you were able to do at 13, 14 years old. The yeah. saints inspired you. Your dad inspired you. Yeah. You kind of pressed in. You, you're battling the darkness. And eventually the Lord fulfills his promise, yeah, basically, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. So uh, after high school, mm -hmm. what'd you do? I did a year of uh, computer engineering. And during that year, I mean, I loved working with computers. It was at the time where the, the internet was just starting up. So there was like tons of money to be made in the high tech. Um, but it was just one of those things, like I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a passionate guy, you know, and I tend to put my heart into whatever I do. And, you know, like everyone else, I, I knew I had certain gifts, you know. And during that year of engineering, um, I just felt like I don't know if I want to give the, my all of who I am, like put my heart into making a, a high tech stock go up. 
you know, to, to make the internet available to the whole world. Not like there's anything wrong with that, but I just, because I'm a, I'm a wholehearted person, I just, I, I thought, like if I, I, I got one life, you know, one life and it's pretty short, you know, compared to eternity. And I just felt like if I'm going to do something in life, my heart is really like I'm in love with God. And I, 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 I want everyone to know God. I believe Jesus needs to be proclaimed. And, and I, that's where my heart was. And it became clear during that first year of engineering. And so I joined the seminary. Was it the Companions? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I found out about the Companions of the Cross. Part of my conversion as I was, you know, seeking God, as I came across a little charismatic prayer group, and it had a big impact on my life. Um, and they introduced me to some of Father uh, Bob Bedard's uh, writings. He's, he's the founder of the Companions of the Cross. And I was deeply impressed with his, his writings. Like, he, he was so real and, and, and he had such a, a, a faith like he, he, he it's like he spoke like like no one else you know I, around me you know and, and and so when I went for my engineering studies I went to his parish which is the parish I'm at right now St. Mary's Parish. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, he was yeah, the now, pastor. Yeah. Now you're the now pastor. pastor. How about that? Um, and I, I got to know him a bit and I just told him where I was at. I said I'm studying engineering like I love it but I I think I might be called to the priesthood you know and um and he said, "Well, why don't you why don't you join us for a year? See what it, you know. See if it, see if it fits, you know." And that's when it was like, "Whoa! <laughs> now it's not just you know fantasizing or daydreaming about becoming a priest. Now it's like, do I do I do it or do I not do it? Like, do I join the seminary or not?" And it, it, you know, it was a huge decision. But I I mean, I, I prayed after he invited me to join for a year, and it was just such a deep peace in a sense that, yeah, God is doing something right now, you know, through the Companions of the Cross. We had all these young seminarians, a lot of fervor and, you know, conversions at St. Mary's. There's a real fire there. And I just felt like the Lord is saying, like, I'm doing something. Just like I've done th things over the ages, this is something I'm doing now. And I want you to be part of it. And, so, and yeah. so I joined. I remember Father Bob too, God rest his soul. He was yeah. such an inspiring, he was, yeah. he was very inspiring and he was also hilarious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so funny, you know, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about the Companions. Yeah, New, new Order of Priests, um, founded, I think, officially in 1985. Um, and we, we're, we're kind of unique in that we're, we're charismatic. Uh, we flow out of the charismatic renewal, um, but we also are, are, are very kind of loyal to the magisterium of the church. So I, I kind of describe us as conservative charismatics, you know, and... Um, uh, and our focus is on, on evangelizing, uh, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the Savior of the world, and you can know him, and he, if you allow him, he'll fill you with his Holy Spirit and change your life. So kind of focusing on the charismatic preaching. Um, but we also, as a community, as a community of priests, uh, we live in community. And so for us, community life isn't just kind of a, a sideline or a, you know, accidental thing, but it's part of our mission, you know, of, of, of loving one another as, as brothers in Christ. And, um, and so we say the quality of our ministry flows out of the quality of our life together. Um, and it's, I love my community, you know, like it's not, it's not humble to say I have the best, I'm in the best community in the world, but I, I kind of feel that way, you know, like I really love, like Father Bob, our founder, he was, you know, totally in love with God, again, a love for the church and the church's teaching, um, but just a, 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 an easygoing, chill guy. And so our community, like one of the things Father Bob told us, he says, listen, we need to take God seriously, but let's not take ourselves too seriously, you know, and so that... That's kind of what's nice about our community is, you know, you got guys totally in love with the Lord, want to preach Jesus, you know, see, see the, you know, Pentecost happening today. Um, but just guys who are real down to earth, you know. And are, there, are there a set of pillars or something that, that you guys yeah, have as your Yeah, foundation? the, four, the, four, the four pillars. So charismatic. So we believe in ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit, using the charisms of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives to us. Um, we're Eucharistic, so we, we you know, emphasize um, the Lord's presence in the Eucharist through, you know, fervent and reverent celebration of, of Mass, but also Eucharistic adoration. Um, we're Marians, so, you know, we're entrusted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We, we know that the Lord gave her to us from the cross, so we um, entrust it to our Blessed Mother. And also we're magisterial, so we believe in the 
you know, the, the teaching of the church. You know, we, we don't want to compromise, um, you know, what, what the church teaches. If someone's listening to the program, they want to know more about the companions. Maybe a young guy is listening to the program and say, oh, I'd like to learn more about them. How can they get in touch with you guys? Yeah, I think our website's companionscross.org. You know, uh, they can check out our website. Uh, and, uh, and apparently, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at different websites. But I've, I've seen our website. It, a lot of people say, I went to your website. I love it. You know, so apparently our website is a good introduction to the Companions of the Cross. We also have a YouTube channel, which has some introductory videos. And or they can just come visit us in our seminary in Detroit or our other locations. Very good. Now, we were talking uh, yesterday a little bit about some of the things you're passionate about, and you're passionate about a lot of things. Yeah. One of the things you were talking about was the, the battle the church is both evangelistic mission and uh, extending the gospel yeah. in a secular world. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you talk to people who just have turned away from the Lord or turned away from the gospel? Or, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone's different, you know, so I don't think it's a one size fits all, but I, I guess like, you know, you, you can't give what you haven't got. And, and the, the thing is, is my, my story is I didn't believe in God. And I didn't believe in God because of the secularism, the, you know, the agnosticism. And what kind of rocked my world was kind of the signs God gives, you know, so, you know, the saints, but also... You know, like I'm just fascinated, for example, by, by, by Eucharistic miracles. Like there's been some recent Eucharistic miracles that have been, med uh, you know, medically, scientifically verified. It's, it's mind boggling. It's like, you know, God saying. For example, for example. Can you... uh, Sokolko in Poland. You, uh, a consecrated host fell to the ground. They did what they were supposed to do. They put it in a receptacle of water and then in, in the, the safe where the chalices are kept so that it could completely dissolve and in a week they would take the dissolved water and you know pour it whatever and our lady's rose bush or whatever came back a week later the the host hadn't dissolved but at the center there was flesh and so what do you mean flesh you mean well, flesh flesh you know how, how did they know well, the, the, the nun, the sacristan, when she opened the safe to, to check on the host a week later, again, assuming it would be completely dissolved. So um, when she opened the safe, the, the safe, the first thing she noticed was the waft of fresh baked bread. And she's just like, okay, that's weird. And then she looked and the host wasn't dissolved, but, but at the center, it was red. Now she didn't know it was flesh, but she's like, okay, why is, why is it red at the center? And why does it not look like consecrated bread? Well, you know, and, and you know how the church works. They take their time, they wait, and, but eventually they had the consecrated host with the red in the center, um, scientifically analyzed. And again, this is just a few years ago. Um, so by just the leading, you know, those f forensic type, uh, whatever you call those people, like, you know, on NCIS, they tell you what sure. exactly. So those people, and they said, what you're dealing with is, is, you know, bread structure wedded to flesh, flesh of the heart of a man. And they can, they can wow. tell, they can tell, I don't know how, but they say the flesh of someone who's about to die. That's, they can tell that, you know, and, and they, of course they ask, like, what is this, you know, and they're told, like, well, where did you get this? Yeah, exactly, this where did yeah. you get this? And, and, and for them, the two things, I mean, the whole thing's mind-boggling, but two things that particularly mind-boggling is the, the bread, a, a lot of the bread, it hadn't dissolved in the water. And they say, like, that doesn't make sense because the, the, the molecular structure, as soon as it water hits it, it, it falls apart. And that didn't happen, but also... Um, how the bread was wedded to the flesh, and they were looking at this with electron and light microscopes. And they're saying like, no science can unite flesh structure with bread structure that you can, that can be observed at a molecular level. And, and they were just, they were blown away, you know, they're saying this is the, and you know, the cool thing about that one is other Eucharistic miracles where the consecrated bread just becomes heart tissue of a man, someone could say, well, some doctor just took a little slice of heart, put it in, and everyone believes it's a miracle. Um, okay, but what about this one? It's not, it's a host. It, it's a consecrated host that has heart tissue now at the center you, united to it. Like, okay, Help us understand. I, I know this is somewhat of a mystery. So yeah. what's, the, what's the message? What's the Lord saying? Yeah, and, yeah. And why, oh, no, why, why that's what's important. Quiet, you know, 
place that hardly yeah. anybody can see. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what is the Lord doing through all that? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, he's screaming to the world that he, he died for us. Again, it's the heart of a dying man. He died out of love for us, and he gives us his living, beating heart. You know, like at Mass, it's Valentine's Day every day. You know? <laughs> the Lord, you know, he comes to us. I mean, you look at the story of the gospel, God becomes man, is stripped and beaten and is crucified out of love for us, says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then his heart is pierced and is, it explodes. Blood and water gushes forth. Like, what's he telling us? Like, I love you. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm dying to, to be united to you. And in the Eucharist, he comes to us and we come to him. There's, there's, that, there's that flesh union, you know, that, that intimate union. Um, you know, with, with a God who loves us more than we could ever describe. You know, St. Faustina, she tried to describe the unfathomable love of God, you know, with the grace of God, and the Lord even told her, you know, you've, you've, you've expressed some of it, but it still doesn't express how much I love you. Father Mark, thank you so much for being with us. It's very powerful. I didn't know we were going to talk about that <laughs> Eucharistic miracle, but I'm glad we did. Yeah, yeah. Friends, the Lord is alive. He's present, he's active, and he's changing lives. The Lord loves you, the Lord knows you, and he died for you. And he wants you to know that love, and it's that love that will change your life. And friends, I want to offer you this new booklet I just wrote called Unfailing Promises. The scripture is full of the promises of God. And God is good, he speaks the truth, and he's got the power to fulfill every promise that he gives. And he says, I'm with you always until the end of the age. He said at one point, uh, based on our subject today, we ended up talking about my body is real food and my blood is real drink. And he wants to feed us, and he wants to feed you because he loves you. If you'd like a copy of this booklet, you can just write to the address on the screen or call the 800 number. Until next week, this is Peter Herbeck and Father Mark.